And here I was thinking I would have a laid back Friday this week, but nope! Rim Brother 1 just had to release a new cannon fodder with all the juicy lore goodness I could want. Damn you! But in all seriousness, welcome back, Cannon Knights. That's right, a new cannon fodder is here, barely more than a week since the last one. Kinda reminds me of the good old pre Halo 5 days when we had weekly cannon fodders. But, nostalgia aside, this latest issue announces a new book, gives us some new details on another, and some new Halo Infinite armor lore. Pretty much everything I, and hopefully you, could ask for. So then, let's dive right in. First up is the new Halo novel from the now legendary Kelly Gay. Titled Halo The Rubicon Protocol, this one is, sadly, not a follow-up to Point of Light. However, the subject matter is rather exciting. As you'll recall from Halo Infinite's trailers, sometime prior to the game's setting, the UNSC lost an ongoing conflict with the Banished. This article specifically states, The campaign starts roughly six months after UNSC forces were ambushed at Zeta Halo. Rubicon Protocol gives us a glimpse at what UNSC forces were doing during that six-month period. No description is included just yet, but we can definitely overanalyze this cover to hell and back. Made by the absolutely amazing William Pixelflare Cameron, this stunning cover of course features the shattered Zeta Halo Installation 07 in the background. We can then see some Sentinels featuring the newer 343 design flying around to the left, and of course, three Spartans in the foreground. At the moment, the identity of these Spartans is unknown, but given Kelly Gay's penchant for bringing in established characters, I wouldn't be surprised if one or two were people we'd encountered before. Maybe Owen B096 or Hazel 302? Maybe we could see Spartan Frank Kodiak return from Hunters in the Dark? She's already pulled characters from that for previous books. Or, since she's already featured them in Renegades, maybe members of Fireteam Apollo? Or they could be entirely new Spartans, or maybe some Spartans that we're going to meet in Halo Infinite. We'll see. Quickly, I've also seen some speculation that these might be members of Blue Team, but we can say with confidence that they are not. All three Spartans are wearing Mark 7 armor here, while Blue Team is wearing Mark 6 Gen 3 variants, as we see on the covers of Shadows of Reach. And if we've learned nothing else over the years, 343 ain't gonna change Blue Team's armors, certainly not for a book cover. Anyway, on the subject of armors, we can see that the Spartan on the actual cover is wearing an Anubis helmet, along with shoulder pads we haven't yet seen. They're also carrying a Halo 5 MA5D. While that, of course, will not be in the game, it's cool to see some weapon variety rather than just Halo Infinite assets. The Blue Spartan has the newer Gen 3 Recon Helmet, or Trailblazer as it seems to be called now. That name speculation is based off a Mega Construct set, so take that with a grain of salt, but we can definitely see that this armor is the Gen 2 Recon-like helmet that we've seen in a few images. The Spartan is also carrying a DMR, I believe the Halo 4 version. And our last Spartan is carrying what appears to be a Series 5 SRS-99 sniper rifle. While the Halo 4 5 Series 5 and Halo Infinite Series 7 are very similar, the scope here is distinctly a Series 5 sniper. The helmet, unfortunately, I cannot make out. I've tried comparing it to known helmets, but we just don't get a good enough look at it. Or I don't. Maybe by the time I post this, someone has figured it out. Anyway, the last thing to really discuss here is the title, The Rubicon Protocol. Now, the first thing that may come to mind for Halo fans is the UNSC Rubicon, a ship that was sent to the Ark in 2554 to track down a mysterious signal. That signal would turn out to be the barely alive 343 Guilty Spark, his memories from his time as the human Chagas awakened. After basically telling the story of Halo Primordium, he hijacked the Rubicon to find the librarian, and if you want the rest of that story, you'll need to read Kelly Gay's other Halo books. A direct connection to the UNSC Rubicon seems a little unlikely, though perhaps the titular Rubicon Protocol could be a reference to the ship, which was lost with all hands. Alternatively, given that the Rubicon recovered a mysterious signal that turned out to be a monitor, maybe the protocol itself was established for similar situations, or perhaps the book's plot deals with the monitor of Installation 07 somehow. Maybe we'll finally see Despondent Pyre. More likely, however, I think, is a historical connection. The Rubicon is a river in Italy where it is said that Julius Caesar uttered the now famous phrase, Alia Iacta Est, or the die is cast. If you're unaware, in 49 BCE, Caesar, who had been given governorship of a region north of Italy proper, was at the end of his term. He was then ordered to disband his army and return to Rome. 
Instead, he took his army south to Rome, ultimately resulting in Caesar becoming Emperor of Rome and establishing the Roman Empire. Because of this, crossing the Rubicon has become a metaphor, meaning to pass a point of no return. In that light, the titular protocol could be something that's initiated in an ultimate doomsday scenario, or perhaps something like Operation Red Flag, a desperate final effort of some sort. Maybe these Spartans are being sent on what amounts to a suicide mission, which would be rather appropriate if they turned out to be Spartan 3s, but I digress. Ultimately, we'll have to wait and see. Halo The Rubicon Protocol is currently slated for release next March, well after Halo Infinite. For more contemporary novel news, we'll skip ahead in the article to talk about Halo Divine Wind. Another from the legendary Troy Denning, this book is a follow-up to certain events in Halo Shadows of Reach. If you want to avoid any potential spoilers if you haven't read that, I'd suggest skipping ahead to the next section, which I've timestamped on screen now. Ready? Okay. So, as you may recall, Shadows of Reach ended with the revelation that Veda Lopez and her Spartan 3 Ferret Squad, Mark G313, Ash G099, and Olivia G291, had infiltrated the Keepers of the One Freedom, a Covenant splinter group that still believed in the Great Journey and accepts humans into its ranks. The Keepers had since joined the Banished and, at the end of the novel, stole a Banished Lich to go through a portal to the Ark, a portal that had just brought Atriox back to our galaxy. Divine Wind will continue that story, and today, we finally get a back-of-book description. October 2559. With the galaxy in the suffocating grip of a renegade artificial intelligence, another perilous threat has quietly emerged in the shadows. The Keepers of the One Freedom, a fanatical and merciless Covenant splinter group, has made its way beyond the borders of the galaxy to an ancient Forerunner installation known as the Ark. Led by an infamous brute named Caster, the Keepers intend to achieve what the Covenant, in all its might, failed to do. Activate a Halo, and take the last steps on the path of the great journey into Transcendence. But unknown to Caster and his new unexpected ally on the Ark, there are traitors to the cause in their midst. Namely, the Ferrets, composed of Office of Naval Intelligence operative Veda Lopez and her young team of Spartan 3s, who have been infiltrating the Keepers to lay the groundwork for Caster's assassination. But with Oni Field operations now splintered and cut off by the Guardian threat, Veda's original mission has suddenly and dramatically escalated in scope. There's simply no choice or fallback plan. Either the Ferrets somehow stop the Keepers, or the galaxy faces an extinction-level event. So, I don't know about y'all, but for me, I immediately got some Hunters in the Dark flashbacks, which was also about stopping the activation of the Halo Array. I enjoyed that story, but I wouldn't want yet another retread of that threat. That said, I have confidence in Troy Denning's ability to make the story interesting. Since the revelations of Shadows of Reach, it's been a bit of a mystery as to why Veda and the Ferrets were with the Keepers. Undoubtedly an Oni mission of sorts, but the exact nature of that mission remained unclear. We now know she was sent in to assassinate, or help assassinate, Caster, a job that's just gotten a bit more complicated thanks to the current state of the galaxy and traveling to the Ark. There are also lingering questions about the role Intrepid Eye might play, the Archeon class Ancilla first introduced in Halo Last Light, and whom has been manipulating humans and keepers behind the scenes since 2553. And then one has to wonder how will Spirit of Fire forces play into this story, if at all? There's already a lot to juggle in this book, so I wouldn't be too surprised if the spirit only gets a light mention here and there, otherwise occupied with the continued banished presence on the Ark, a presence caster will undoubtedly be avoiding, given that he just betrayed Atriox. Still, how cool would it be to have Veda, who operates with a team of 20-year-old Spartan 3s, run into Red Team, a team of washed-out and re-augmented Spartan 2s, who are biologically only 20 years old themselves? It would be an absolutely surreal moment for all parties, I suspect. But again, I think the book is likely to avoid bringing the Spirit of Fire into things. And since we're returning to the Ark, it's inevitable that someone is going to ask about Mendicant Bias. Again, I suspect he won't appear at all, as awesome as that would be. Still, don't let that get you down, as there is plenty to love about this book. Veda and the Ferrets are always interesting, and as we can see from the cover art, it seems we'll be dealing with a Sanchayun prelate during this story. That's basically a prophet equivalent to a Spartan, by the way. Does this prelate work for the Banished? Is he a remnant of the Covenant forces brought to the Ark with Truth in 2552, something we saw in the short story Sacrifice? We'll have to wait and see. For me, I'm extremely excited for this book. While Caster obviously doesn't succeed in firing the rings, might his actions play a behind-the-scenes role in setting up Infinite? 
or maybe he'll have a lasting effect on the Spirit of Fire and Banished conflict already going on at the Ark. What new secrets about our galaxy in the Ark might be uncovered during this story? And most importantly, will it be Caster's last? Will Veda have to kill him to stop the rings from being fired? Halo Divine Wind will release on October 19th this year, and I can't wait to get my hands on it. One last thing that unexpected ally is likely referring to Inslan Gadogai, a blade master formerly of the Silent Shadow. He was originally tasked with watching over Caster after the Keepers had joined the Banished, and ended up joining the Keepers before they departed for the Ark. Wrapping up this last issue is a look at more helmet lore, though not just for Halo Infinite, but MCC as well. The issue, of course, highlights the Keystone-class helmet just added to Halo 4 with the latest MCC season. The Keystone Enhancement Suite represents a Materials Group evolutionary design that, when combined with elements developed on early Mark VII iterations, such as the example seen worn by Spartan Naomi 010, as well as the Gen 2 Decimator Suite, among others, eventually formed the basis of the production Mark VII in Mjolnir's third development generation. Not a whole lot to break down there, but it's great nonetheless. It's awesome enough to see a new helmet added to Halo 4, never mind a prototype Mark VII helmet that we'll be sporting in Halo Infinite. I especially love that it's designated Keystone rather than just Mark VII. It's more unique that way, and it's fitting as the helmet represents, or seems to represent, the Keystone, or Foundation, of the final Mark VII Gen 3 platform. Moving over to Infinite, we start with the Anubis Helmus. The Gen 2 helmet was known to integrate Senghili technologies, but the new lore today gives us a better idea on how that works. The Anubis is unusual in that its structural frame and core electronics are grown inside Sanghili assembly forges, though final assembly and integration uses traditional fabrication techniques. This isn't the first time we've heard about Covenant or Sanghili in this case, technology being grown, so to speak. Forerunner ships are quote-unquote grown from design seeds, and Covenant technology used a derivation known as design patterns. These patterns were fed into nanomachine assemblers, resulting in what was being built from full-size ships to smaller technologies, and in this case, the inner components of the Anubis helmet. The Anubis helmet is manufactured by Lethbridge Industrial, a company named for the city of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada, home to Dan Greenskull Hamill and Jeff Woods, prominent members of the Halo community. We next have the Mark V Zeta helmet, the one that kind of resembles the Chief's Project Cobalt helmet and his Mark VI mod helmet from Halo 4 and 5. Designed by the Materials Group, the group that first built Mjolnir in conjunction with Dr. Halsey, Spartans assigned to Oni Xenomaterials Exploitation Group on Installation 07, found that their upgraded Mark V's mix of high threat response and surveillance interlinks were ideal for the ring's peculiar operating environment. This Mark V variant, a very odd design to be sure, has found prominent use on Zeta Halo, hence the designation. The Xeno Materials Exploitation Group first appeared in Halo Hunters in the Dark, and has featured in a couple of Troy Denning's stories, though most notably Halo Last Light. As their name implies, they are tasked with recovering and reverse engineering alien technologies. After that, we have a new helmet, the Cavallino, manufactured by Emerson Tactical Systems. The Cavallino expands Emerson's offerings with Mjolnir platform helmets, tailored for the needs of fireteam leaders, trainers, and combat observers. Emerson Tactical Systems is first mentioned in Halo 5, having developed the Void Dancer class Mjolnir armor. That armor did not meet Mjolnir standards, sacrificing compatibility so Emerson could integrate its own black box components, which raised a number of alarms for Oni. It seems that with Cavallino, Emerson is trying to expand its Mjolnir holdings. Some people have noted a similarity between this and Recruit Armor, but I think that's cosmetic at best. The name is rather odd, as it's an Italian word for a colt or young horse, and the name of an Italian town. I'm not really sure how any of that relates to the helmet, its function or purpose, or the company. I was able to find a magazine called Cavallino, which bills itself as the destination for all Ferrari enthusiasts. I do know Jeff Easterling, Grim Brother 1, used to work in the motorsports or racing profession, so I'm guessing the name of this helmet is a reference to that. Finally, we have a Gen 1 helmet, Grenadier, another Materials Group production. Grenadier helmets are officially categorized as prototypes, as Navspec War wrestles with the overwhelming cost of its lightweight armored composite shell. The mention of cost here seems to be a nice throwback to Halo Ghosts of Onyx, which mentioned early Mjolnir suits costing as much as a destroyer to produce. 
The Grenadier helmet was originally a modified Mark IV helmet and used as an early and ultimately fruitless test bed for Mjolnir shielding technology. The Grenadier helmet is part of a larger UNSC effort to recondition and upgrade old Covenant War era gear with newer and optimized components, not unlike what they did when going from Gen 1 to Gen 2. And as awesome as all this new lore is, however, I again must raise concerns about whether we'll be able to mix and match certain parts from Gen 1 and Gen 3. To quote the article when going from the Gen 3 stuff to Gen 1, the above options pieces were developed from the ground up as the initial wave of the Gen 3 Mjolnir suite. Of course, you'll also have the opportunity to pursue the Gen 1 Mark 5B platform as well, with its own array of available modifications. For the most part, I can understand why certain attachments and such can't work across armor cores, but I can't imagine any reason why we shouldn't be able to mix and match helmets and shoulder pieces from across armor cores, save for any artificial limitations. The fact that 343 have yet to say anything on the matter only further raises concerns. Hopefully these concerns can be addressed one way or another very soon. With that though, we conclude this latest, packed full issue of Cannon Fodder. Despite my concerns about Infinite's customization, the book news here alone has me hyped. Divine Wind has a lot of potential ground to cover, but Troy Denning has yet to let me down. And the Rubicon Protocol sounds like an amazing news story from an author I have come to thoroughly enjoy, both when it comes to Halo and with her own work. But those are just my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Stick around for the Patreon shoutout, and until next time, this has been Halo Cannon. First, I'd like to give a big thank you to our Horospice patrons. First, there's Hope. Then we have Freight. Followed by SS Dikochan, Justin Montgomery. And finally, Discombobulated Sycophant. Thank you all for your amazing support of the channel. Next, I'd like to thank our theoretical patrons. If you'd like to see your name here or get a direct shout out, check out patreon.com slash halocanon. You can simply support the channel or get additional benefits, such as behind the scenes material, including the raw audio for upcoming videos, and even shout outs like this. All patrons now get early access to certain videos as well, and more benefits are to come. However, your continued viewership is more than enough for me. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and maybe even subscribing to the channel if you aren't already. If you really enjoy this, turn on that notification bell so you can be among the first to see new videos when they release. But for all my fellow Canaanites, keep on being awesome.